you now is Bread of His Presence with your host, Pastor Cameron Urey, Senior Pastor and Bible Teacher at Renton Park Chapel in Renton, Washington. Well, greetings and welcome to Bread of His Presence. You know, the most important books ever to be written are without a doubt the four Gospels because they introduce us to our Lord and Savior, Jesus Christ. They tell of His earthly ministry, They tell how we can enter into a relationship with God in and through Him. And yet, there's also another source that's almost equally important as the Gospels. In fact, so much so that it's actually been called the fifth Gospel. And that is the culture of the Bible. The original audience, the original setting, even the original language Because it's really the culture that gives us a lens through which we can better understand Jesus. And so that's what we've been trying to do in this series. To dive into the first century world of Jesus in order that we might get to know him better. And most recently, we've been looking at one of the titles that I think is really one of the ones that is most culturally distant from us. And that is this term, rabbi. What did it mean to be a rabbi and to have disciples in that day? And if you were with us last week, you'll remember that there were two kinds of men who are called rabbis in the Gospels. The first were Torah teachers, whom we discussed at length. But the second type, the class that Jesus belonged to, was the class of rabbis known as rabbis with shmiha. And rabbis with shmiha, they possessed unmatched knowledge of the scriptures. They were humble. They were compassionate towards people. They had unbelievable chutzpah, devotion to God. And they were believed by their community to have been given direct authority from God to make new teachings. Now, a Torah teacher, as educated as he was, he could only ever quote and explain the Bible. And he would do so with the phrase, it is written. Sound familiar? (laughs) But rabbis with shmiha, they were able to say on occasion, you have heard it said, but I say to you. Now, they didn't contradict the Word of God, but they could make new teachings or come up with new interpretations of the Word of God that other rabbis had not said before. There were about a dozen of rabbis with Shmiha in the hundred years covering the time that Jesus lived, and they were the best of the best. They were the all-stars. I mean, we think of rabbis like Hillel, Shammai, Akiva, Gamaliel— Um, And there are many others. But it's this class of rabbis and this class alone that could have disciples. These rabbis with special authority, with shmiha, were the ones who had followers. Now, Torah teachers could have students, but not disciples. You had to be recognized as being a rabbi with shmiha. Now, listen to Matthew 7. Verses 28 to 29. It says, Now it happened that when Jesus had finished these words, the crowds were astonished at his teaching. For he was teaching them as one having authority, shmiha, and not as their scribes. You see, they could immediately recognize that Jesus, he was speaking as one who had shmiha. And so the obvious question, which is asked often of Jesus, is where did you get the authority to say such a thing? Now, what you and I miss, because we don't know the culture, is that in asking this, they're not necessarily saying, I don't like what you said, Jesus. No, sometimes, not all the time, but sometimes they just want to know where Jesus has gotten his authority. Because if he really does have shmiha from God, then they have to listen to him. If he doesn't have shmiha, then it's just his opinion, and they don't have to listen to him. Now, this raises, I think, a very important question. 
how did a rabbi get shmiha? Well, to answer that, we need to look back at who the rabbis considered to be the first rabbi. And that was Moses, or Moshe. He's the first senior pastor in the Bible. He's God's chosen leader over the Israelite people who, remember, leads them out of Egypt to the Promised Land. Now, remember that he was very tired and he was very overworked because he was judging all the disputes of all the people. And when his father-in-law came to visit and he observes how Moses is conducting things, he immediately tells Moses to delegate. And so Moses, what does he do? He picks 70 helpers to aid him in judging the people. We see this in Numbers chapter 11. Moses and Aaron, they lay hands on these people, and they transfer their authority to them. Now, because of that, Jews believed that the way you got Shmiha was by two rabbis, both of whom had to have Shmiha themselves, declaring publicly that you had it. And so that is how they believed the role of rabbis with Shmiha was passed down from Moses onwards all the way down to Jesus. By the way, it's interesting. How many men did Moses and Aaron lay hands on? Seventy. How many disciples did Jesus send out into every city in Luke 10? Seventy. Do you see how Jesus, even in doing that, is referencing the text, connecting himself and his authority right back to Moses and to Aaron? Now, there's another gem here that I know blows my mind, and I hope will blow yours as well. But first, we have to ask another question. Where did Jesus get his shmiha? Well, I'll tell you. In rabbinic dialogue... The way that you would teach is by asking questions. And the way that you answer a question is with another question. And so let's say that a disciple were to, in class, ask his rabbi, Hey, rabbi, why doesn't God want us to eat lizards? Well, the rabbi might turn it over to the class for debate. But you'd always preface your argument with, It is written. Nobody said, I think. If you were to say that, everyone around you would immediately say, who cares? We don't care what you think. We care what God thinks. And so they would quote the text. It is written, and God saw everything he made, and behold, it was good. So why can't we eat lizards? And the rabbi would say, good question. And they would question back and forth, citing the text, and eventually the rabbi might quote the text from Genesis, when God curses the snake, who may have been a lizard first, saying, you will crawl on your belly in the dust because of what you did to Eve. Well, class, what do you think about that? And so, with each round of questions, they're getting deeper and deeper into the text of Scripture. And they still do the same kind of thing today, by the way. But it's a question-based way of learning and dialoguing. And your answer was most often in the form of a question. Now, just to give you another example of this, I heard a man by the name of Ray Vanderlaan tell of how a lady colleague of his went with him on one of his group trips to Israel. And Ray said something that he said later was probably put a little bit too dogmatically. But he said that Jesus isn't the answer man. He's the question man. And he said that to the group because of how often in Scripture, when people came to Jesus and they asked him a question, what would he do? He'd respond with another question. That's just what rabbis would do. But this lady got really offended She said, well, Jesus is my answer, man. She just didn't understand. And so they had kind of this ongoing back and forth kind of thing where she would say, hey, look, here Jesus gave an answer. And Ray would say, hey, look, here Jesus asked a question. And this went on for two weeks. But it all ended when, while they were in Israel, they went into a photography shop 
owned by this old Jewish rabbi who did this on the side. He was a Holocaust survivor who had survived a concentration camp. And this lady was looking at all the art on his wall. And being an art teacher, she asked, Can I ask you a question? Now, she had no idea what she was getting into. (laughs) But he, being a rabbi, of course said, Yes, what? And she said, Which is your favorite? And he said, Are you married? Now, fortunately for her, she said, Yes, why? Because if she hadn't included the why, then that would have been the end of it. But she asked why. Now, do you think he responds with an answer? No, he's Jewish. He responds with another question. So he asked, do you have any children? And she said, yes, a son and two daughters. Why? And he asked, which is your favorite? Do you see what he did? You know, she walked out of that shop with tears in her eyes, saying, I get it. I get it. That's rabbinic dialogue. You ask questions back and forth until you answer your own question. Because when you come to the point where you answer your own question, it's not the teacher's answer. It's yours. It belongs to you. That is the power behind the Jewish art of asking questions. Now, Having said all this, let's go to the Temple Mount in Jerusalem as we return to our question about where Jesus got his shmiha, because it says in Mark chapter 11, Then they came again to Jerusalem, and as he was walking in the temple, the chief priests and the scribes and the elders came to him and began saying to him, By what authority are you doing these things? Or who gave you this authority to do these things? And so they ask him a question. And Jesus said to them, I will ask you one question, and you answer me. And then I will tell you by what authority I do these things. Was the baptism of John from heaven or from men? Answer me. Now, keep in mind that in rabbinic dialogue, your question was also your answer. And we'll see that more in the coming weeks. But for now, just understand that Jesus is not, as it may look to us, changing the subject or sidestepping the question. No, the question regarding John's baptism is also his answer. He's either saying that he got his shmiha from John or from the same place that John did. Which, by the way, shows that Jesus had an enormous amount of respect for John the Baptist and saw him as a person with shmiha as well. The people certainly did. But notice what Jesus is doing. He's pointing back to John the Baptist and to the baptism he received from John. Why? Well, who baptized Jesus? John. But who was the second? Remember? When it comes to Shmiha, there has to be two. Well, it is written, Matthew 3, 16-17, As soon as Jesus was baptized, he went up out of the water. At that moment, heaven was opened, and he saw the Spirit of God descending like a dove and alighting on him. And a voice from heaven said, This is my Son, whom I love. With him I am well pleased. You know, one of Ray Vanderlaan's professors in a Jewish class said, and keep in mind that he didn't believe Jesus was the Messiah, but he said, this boy over here, this Gentile, he has the only rabbi in history whose shmiha comes directly from God since Moses and Aaron. You see, Jesus is unique. Not only does he have Shmiha, but he received his Shmiha, his authority, from God himself. Now, in light of that, let me read for you a verse that I hope you will never read the same again. And I think will really drive the point home for why this matters for us. It says in Matthew 9, verses 1 through 8, And getting into a boat, Jesus crossed over the sea, and came to his own city. 
And behold, they brought to him a paralytic lying on a bed. Seeing their faith, Jesus said to the paralytic, Take courage, son. Your sins are forgiven. And behold, some of the scribes said to themselves, This man blasphemes. And Jesus, knowing their thoughts, said, Why are you thinking evil in your hearts? For which is easier, to say your sins are forgiven, or to say, get up and walk? Now, first of all, notice how Jesus responds with a question. And secondly, the answer to that question is that obviously it's easier to say your sins are forgiven because that's something that cannot be seen. You can't see spiritual healing happen in the same way that you can see a man with shriveled, paralyzed legs suddenly grow bigger, stronger legs and then stand up. And so how will you know that Jesus really does have the shmiha from God to forgive sins? Well, that's the point. Jesus says, but so that you may know that the Son of Man has authority on earth to forgive sins. Then he said to the paralytic, get up, pick up your bed and go home. And he got up and went home. But when the crowds saw this, they were afraid and glorified God who had given such authority to men. Now, it's that element of shmiha that impacts us the most intimately and affects us the most profoundly, that Rabbi Yeshua, the very Son of God, bore special authority to cleanse us of our sins and restore us to God in and through his death and resurrection. And so I want to close today simply by inviting you, if you haven't already done so, to lay hold of Jesus and his authority, his shmiha today, so that you also might experience forgiveness and freedom and release from all your sins. And in knowing he who is life, you also might abide in his life for all eternity do so today. Amen. Today's episode of Bread of His Presence is brought to you by Renton Park Chapel, a church that is committed to the ministry of sharing the joy of hearing and doing God's Word and to the mission of bringing people into the life-giving presence of Jesus Christ in and through vibrant preaching, teaching, Bible study, prayer, and ministry to a world that is in desperate need of the healing touch of Jesus Christ. If you'd like to learn more about our ministry here at Renton Park Chapel or would like to subscribe to the Bread of His Presence podcast, you can visit us online at rentonparkchapel.org or breadofhispresence.org. You can also find us on Facebook, YouTube, Twitter, and Instagram. We look forward to hearing from you. Thank you for listening. And may you know all the fullness of having in your life the Bread of the Presence of God.